Good evening, I'm Maine Castillo. I'm Town Hall's Program Manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle and University of Washington, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation featuring cutting edge research I'm by UW graduate students, Hector Delgado Diaz, Michelle Cadigan, and Ashley R. Towns. This is the third of six in our series, UW Engage Science, and we are so pleased to be able to offer this platform to these students and their important and engaging work. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank tonight's speakers for appearing to help make that possible. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us during Give Big, a statewide campaign to come together and invest in community. Give Big is taking place May 4th and 5th this year, and you can find the link to support Town Hall in the chat. Town Hall is adding new programs every day. You can check out what's upcoming by visiting our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Tonight's program will include three separate presentations with a time for questions at the end. Each, pre each presentation is about 20 minutes long. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video player, so please submit those at any time. You can also text questions to 206-504-2857 as noted in the chat. If you can be sure if you can be sure to address the question to the presenter you intend it for, that would be greatly appreciated appreciated. We cannot guarantee we'll be able to get to every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for rewatching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arnold Matulski Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Northcliffe Foundation, Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Hector Delgado Diaz is an astronomer and astrobiologist who is passionate about the search for extraterrestrial life. He studies the efficiency of each observation technique used to look at planets outside the solar system and creates simulations of how the atmospheres of the exoplanets would look like through the lens of space telescopes. Hector is a second year grad student and originally from Puerto Rico. Please join me in welcoming Hector Delgado Diaz. Thank you for the introduction, Megan. Before I start my presentation, um, I would like to give a disclaimer because this is an online presentation. Some of the animation might be a little bit laggy, but I do hope you can still enjoy the talk. Through many civilizations, humanity has always been curious about its surroundings. What is fire? How did life originate on Earth? What are those shiny dots that appear in the sky at night? To some extent, we have been able to answer this and many other questions, but there is still one question that has and still haunts us. Is there life outside of Earth? Thanks to the evolution of technology, we now know that Earth is just a speckle in this vast universe. And here I am just showing the tiny dot that we are in our galaxy, the Milky Way, which has billions of stars like the sun. And to make us more insignificant, the Milky Way is one of the billions of galaxies that exist in the universe. That's right billions would be. We also understand better that some of those shiny dots in the sky are planets like Mars, Venus, or Saturn. Other dots are like our stars like our sun. And recently, we found out that those stars also have planets around them. With all this information, we can now be on the lookout for extraterrestrial life. It is reasonable to think that the best place to look for life is in our neighbor planets. Let's look at the planets that are closely similar to Earth in our solar system. These are called rocky planets. There has been speculation that life could exist in Mars or recently Venus, so many satellites and spacecrafts have been sent out to study them. Therefore, there are many teams of scientists studying those planets and their possibility of life. As for Mercury, you can see that it is very close to the sun, diminishing the chances for life to thrive there, but I will not discard it. As for the rest of the planets, which we usually call gas giants, 
they are so different than Earth that we do not expect life to be found there. Not only because they're evidently much larger than our, than our planet, but also as big as they are, as extreme the environment could be for life. However, taking a closer look at Jupiter and Saturn, we find moons around them that could possibly harbor life. As of now, there are plans to send spacecrafts to study them, or some of these moons in, in detail later in the future. Most of these discoveries have been possible thanks to the advances in technology and how we have been able to improve our telescopes. From telescopes that we have to look through the lens, all the way to big antennas and even space telescopes. And especially with space telescopes, like the Kepler telescope, which was launched to space in 2009, or the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, also known as TESS, we have seen planets around other stars, so-called exoplanets. And how many have we found? Well, this video here is showing some of those planets found by the Kepler telescope. It is a collage, meaning that they are all cramped up together for illustration purposes, but in real life, they are very, very far away from each other. These are star systems like the solar system. Every dot you see shows different size of planets going around their own star, from small ones like Mercury, all the way to Jupiter size or bigger. You can also see different temperatures that go from as warm as Earth, all the way to possibly a world made of lava. And how many exoplanets have been discovered? More than 4,000 exoplanets. A number this big means a greater chance to find life. Even though our solar system is still a good place to search for life, these discoveries will help us progress faster to answer this age old question about the universe. So how do we go about studying planets that are so far away and we still don't have the technology to travel to them? There are so many ways, but I will be focusing particularly on one that has proven to be successful, the transit method. And you'll see why it is called that way. Imagine it's nighttime. You're looking in this pitch black forest. You might possibly be thinking about life if we're alone in the universe or just alone in the forest. Suddenly, not so far away, you see a dim lantern hanging on a tree. While admiring this small blip of light, a flying object starts moving around it. Every time it passes or transits between you and the lantern, you can identify it better. The shape of its shadow seems to be a butterfly, but you're not sure since you can see in detail its wings. But let's imagine you now have better vision and when the object is close to the lantern, you can see its all color and features of a butterfly. This is the same idea behind looking for and studying exoplanets. Let's imagine you are now the telescope. You can pick if you want to be a Kepler telescope or test, and you're looking at two different stars, our sun on the left side and a smaller, colder star on the right. Note that some the stars come in different sizes and temperatures. Both of them have an exoplanet transiting around them that is the same size to the left of each star. On the bottom part, there is a graph measuring how much light you are receiving from each star. The vertical line is measuring how much can you see from the star. 100% means you can see the whole star. And right now you, the telescope, can see both stars completely. So 100% of them. The horizontal line of the graph describes where is the exoplanet located in front of the star. The red dashed line will guide you through it. But when the exoplanet starts transiting, it starts blocking part of the light you receive. The interesting thing is that the star on the right, because it is smaller than the sun, when an exoplanet transits between you and the star, it blocks more light than, we, than what it would block if it was transiting the sun. And then the planet moves to a point that is no longer blocking the star and we see the whole star again. At the end, exoplanets around smaller stars are easier to find and study because they block more light compared to a bigger star. And you can see the effect on how low the percentage of light received goes on the smaller star. The, this idea is the same as the solar eclipse that occurred in 2017, where the moon, the moon transited between us and the sun, blocking the majority of, life we, of light we receive from the star. Looking closely at the exoplanet, unfortunately, the current telescope 
exoplanets that we have, we're able to study up to a certain point those exoplanets. We don't know what they're made of, and it could be endless possibilities of what this exoplanet could look like. What if the exoplanet is too hot, too hot or too cold, or maybe the right temperature for life? Does it have the necessary nutrients for life to continue, to continue living over there? Does it have water, an essential and vital part for life? But worry no more because the James Webb Space Telescope is here to answer these questions. It may not look like a telescope, but it is. The honeycomb shape is formed by mirrors that will reflect the light to another mirror and into the lens where all this light will be the essential information for studying exoplanets. As we saw previously, the small red stars are easier to study their exoplanets because they block a lot more of the light coming from the star. But the James Webb Space Telescope will be more powerful, will be powerful enough to discern between the light of the star being blocked by the solid part of the planet and the light being blocked by the atmosphere of the planet. In other words, this telescope will be able to see the atmosphere of the exoplanets. The yellow arrow represents the size of the exoplanet that makes that dip on the amount of light received from the star, while the red dashed lines show how much of that light is being blocked by the atmosphere of the, of the planet. If we compare how much light will the atmosphere of the planet block on a star like the sun versus a smaller star, we can see that it is not much compared to the right side, making it very difficult to study. Therefore, if we want to study the atmosphere of exoplanets with the James Webb Telescope, we should look for smaller stars. Going back to the previous image, if we look at this bird's eye view of Earth, we can see how the atmosphere blocks the light coming from the sun that is on the left corner of this picture shining towards us. That means that part of the light being blocked by the planet is due to the atmosphere. For us humans, the atmosphere looks just blue and with clouds. But the James Webb Telescope is so powerful that it could observe what the atmosphere is actually made of. It can see oxygen, which is what we breathe and is essential for life. Carbon dioxide, what we exhale, but important from plants, which in turn gives us back the oxygen. Water vapor, completely crucial for life. And possibly nitrogen, which we have in our proteins and DNA. Other reasons that the atmosphere is important for life aside of its components are, it contains clouds that help with the water cycle and move other important nutrients. It acts as a shield against threats like asteroids. And it also has the ozone layer that protects us from harmful ultraviolet rays. As you can see in this image on the right, those harmful rays coming from the sun are being blocked by the ozone layer. If we didn't have this protection, we would have to live fearful of the sun. These and many other reasons are what makes it important to study the atmosphere of exoplanets if we want to find life. Now that we know the telescope is capable of doing this task, we need to choose out of the 4,000 plus planets discovered which ones would be good to study, or we at least think have the highest chance to harbor life, since it would, since it would take a huge amount of time and effort for the telescope to study the exoplanets one by one. Enter the Trappist one star. Why this one? Well, it contains seven exoplanets and each of them are rocky planets, or in other words, they are similar to the size of Earth. It is a small cold star, meaning that the amount of light from the star blocked by the exoplanet is pretty big compared to bigger stars. However, there is one detail, there is one little detail. As mentioned previously, we have not been able to see the atmosphere of exoplanets so we don't know what would they look like. Could one of the planets look like Earth? What if one of them looks like, looks like Mars? Possibly a Venus? Or maybe even a world made of lava we've never seen before? Or anything else that we could possibly imagine? Another important feature in this picture is that it shows how hot the planets could be. To illustrate why this is important to know, I will use a not to scale glass of water. Close to the star, where it is hotter, you can see some gas, which refers to temperatures so high that water would be evaporated all the time, and thus the water in the glass would become vapor, so we wouldn't be able to drink any. Now, far away on the right side of the image, you can see some trails of ice where we expect water to be frozen all the time. That means our glass of water 
will be frozen and we won't be able to use the water. So it would be hard for life to survive here too. Only in between, there are droplets of water. So hopefully the exoplanets in that region could have liquid water. But aside of these features, as a bonus, it is relatively near to us. And maybe we can travel there in the future. And when I say relatively near to us, if you were to point it out on the Milky Way, where do you think it would be? That's right, exactly next to us. <laughs> However, while it looks really close to us, it would take us 40 years to get there, traveling at the speed of light. We will have to be as fat as the lightning from a thunder for 40 years to make it to Trappist one Nevertheless, this is where it gets exciting because with the James Webb Telescope, we will be able to find out what kind of, a, what kind of atmospheres this Trappist one could have. But wait a minute, the telescope has not been launched to space yet. So this is where my work comes into play because it still hasn't been launched to space. We want to make sure that the telescope can in fact study in more details these exoplanets. This is the only mathematical equation I will show, I promise. So you take me, plus sitting down in front of a computer for hours, I get to create scenarios of this telescope observing planets around other stars, uh, other stars and understand if it can actually see their atmosphere and what they're made of. It is worth noting that the tools I used to create these scenarios were developed by past students from the University of Washington astronomy department. But for example, I would tell this virtual telescope, telescope, observe that planet around that side. Now, let's say the exoplanet is an exact copy of Earth. Can you see if he has an atmosphere? If you can see the atmosphere, can you also see if he has oxygen that is essential for us to breathe? What if, instead of being an exact copy of Earth, it is a planet that looks like Venus? Can you also see that atmosphere? Because it is completely different than Earth, can you also see what it is made of? After creating many scenarios for different exoplanets with a variety of atmospheres outside of Earth and Venus, the results are in. Taking, for example, the closest exoplanet to the Trappist-1 star, since it shows interesting results, which it is called Trappist-1b, by the way. <laughs> That's the name of the planet. I asked the telescope different questions, and because we don't know what kinds of atmosphere could that planet have, we came up with different types of atmosphere just to see how well does the telescope works. We have a copy of a Venus atmosphere with no clouds. The reason we created an atmosphere like Venus but with no clouds is because this planet, Trappist-1b, is so close to the star that even the clouds would be scorched by the heat. An atmosphere mostly made of oxygen. We don't have an atmosphere like this in our solar system, but since oxygen is important for us and there are endless possibilities of atmospheres, we decided to create one that would be beneficial for life as we know it. And that same atmosphere, but with no water vapor in it to see if we can distinguish between the two of them. The first question and the most important one, because if the answer is no, then the rest of the answers for the following questions are also a no. Can the telescope see the atmosphere? And for the three atmosphere, it was able to do it. What about oxygen? Are you able to see it in each of the atmospheres? Unfortunately, it couldn't see oxygen in the Venus atmosphere and it could possibly see, see the oxygen for most of the oxygen atmospheres. What about carbon dioxide? and it was able to see it in all of them. And water vapor? Well, it could not see it for an atmosphere like Venus. It did see it for an atmosphere mostly of oxygen. And the last one does not have water, so it did not see it, which means our computer telescope is working properly. This comes to show how important it is to produce different scenarios because depending on the type of atmosphere, the telescope will be able to see or not see what it's made of. Made of. What does this information tell us? There is a popular short story about a group of people were, were, who were blindfolded, blindfolded and were tasked to describe what they had in front of them. They did not know it was an elephant. The person near the tusk thought they, they were spears. Close to the trunk thought it was a snake, a tree by the foot, the tail was a rope, and the ears were a fan. But maybe if they all came together and discussed what they all perceived, they could know that it was an elephant. The same thing happens here. We can see that the planet has an atmosphere. 
We can also see it has important components for life to thrive there, thrive there like oxygen, water, and carbon dioxide. But we cannot see everything about the exoplanet like its surface. So like the short story, the elephant here represents extraterrestrial life. And we need to see more than just parts of the exoplanet to be able to know if we have found life or not. Therefore, Will we find life with the James Webb Space Telescope? The bad news is not really, since we will only be seeing at most the atmosphere of the exoplanets. But the good news are, we verified that the telescope will be able to see the atmospheres on exoplanets around small stars. Out of the 4,000 plus exoplanets, we have found good candidates that would be good for the telescope to observe in better detail. And once the telescope observed these exoplanets, we will have more information and clarity as to what we need to do for future telescope so that we can continue our search for life. And there are already plans to search for life more thoroughly than ever before. These are ideas that are, that are in the works to look, to look at exoplanets and find extraterrestrial life. They will be more powerful than the James Webb telescope, meaning that we might be able to see more than just the atmospheres. Their names are the Habitable Exoplanet Telescope, the War Telescope, Lynx X-ray Observatory, and Origin Space Telescope. They might come up soon, but soon means after 2030. But even though it took us time to understand what fire is and its benefits, it, it is taking us time to understand how did life originate on Earth, although we are little by little approaching to the truth, the same way we are progressing to find extraterrestrial life. And although this project is one small step, small, one small step for research, it will help us do a giant leap towards answering, are we alone in the universe? Thank you. Thank you so much, Hector. That was a fantastic presentation. If you have any questions for Hector, please put them in the chat now before you, before you forget. All right, our next speaker is Michelle Cadigan. Michelle is a PhD candidate of sociology and NSF graduate fellow at the University of Washington. She studies the intersection of economic markets and the criminal justice system in the fight for racial justice. Her current work examines how states rewrite criminal laws and build markets for cannabis in a way that facilitate or hinder racial equity and justice. Michelle is a member of the Washington State Legislative Task Force for Cannabis Equity. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Cadigan. Thank you, Megan. Let me share my screen. Okay. So thank you for that introduction. And I want to start this talk by telling you a story. This is Michael Thompson. In 1996, he was sentenced to serve 40 to 60 years in prison after he sold three pounds of cannabis to a confidential informant. After the sale, officers searched his home and found guns locked away in a gun locker, many legally registered to his wife, and saddled him with gun charges that led Michigan courts essentially to sentence him to spend the rest of his life behind bars. While incarcerated, Michael missed the death of his father and his only son, the births of his grandchildren, and many more other important family moments. Michael Thompson is not alone. Research shows that although consumption of cannabis is relatively the same between white and black individuals, black individuals are two and a half times more likely to be arrested for a cannabis related offense. That means for every two white individuals that gets arrested for a cannabis related crime, there are five black folks that are arrested for similar offenses. Recognizing that these laws disproportionately impact people of color, particularly young black men, Washington became the first of two states to legalize the sale and use of recreational cannabis for adults 21 years or older in 2012. I began my work interviewing and observing cannabis retail stores in Washington state in 2016, or two years after the first cannabis retail store opened in Seattle. And it was here where I encountered Mark. I spoke with Mark at a coffee shop near the cannabis retail store he owned in 2017. He was an average looking white dude, uh, late 30s, early 40s, sporting a hoodie and some jeans. 
Mark told me that prior to opening his store, he knew very little about cannabis and had only tried it a few times before opening, uh, before winning a license to run the business in the state lotto. <laughs> when Washington first started to license recreational cannabis businesses, they used the lottery system. You could think of this like the actual lottery where you have a bowl full of numbers and if they pull out your number, you win the lottery. Or in this case, you're eligible to apply for one of the few available cannabis licenses. <laughs> a relative told Mark, hey, you should throw your hat in the ring. And then if you win a license, I'll come up and help you run the business. Well, Mark was one of the few individuals to actually win a license this way. He quit his day job and dedicated all of his time to running this business. I asked Mark to reflect upon his role in the industry and the legalization movement. Virtue responded, there's clearly social justice implications to legalizing cannabis. <laughs> People of color are disproportionately convicted, even though use rates for R for petty drug crimes across races about constant. So historically, cannabis has been kind of a catch-all tactic where if law enforcement wants to bust you for something, they'll bust you for holding a gram of weed. But at the same time, the legalization was, is in some places controversial. So it's important to have people that are upstanding law-abiding professionals that will run safe establishments kind of be the model so that it ultimately succeeds. Mark clearly understands that cannabis disproportionately and historically impacts people of color, but to him, racial bias lives in the realm of the criminal justice system. The market on the other hand is a cleansing force that through legalization and having people who are law abiding running these businesses, other states will see that these establishments can be run safely and successfully by professionals and thus maybe more inclined to legalize. Therefore, in Mark's eyes, the success of his store will be upheld as proof that legalization can work and will keep people of color out of jail and the criminal justice system and other states that decide to get on board. And while Mark represents just one individual, his sentiment that true professionals will bring legitimacy to this market and spread legalization movement was a theme found throughout my data collection, which as I mentioned earlier, began in 2016. And between 2016 and 2018, I interviewed 64 individuals who worked at or owned cannabis retail establishments across Seattle and spent over hundred hours observing three different shops. Just like I did with Mark, I asked individuals to tell me how they got involved in the industry and what they saw their role being in the legalization movement. Steve, the owner of a shop that I call Wonderment, told me, you have to be paying taxes and show where your money is coming from. It's from a legit business, no major felonies. If you're not a gangster, then you should have no problem getting a license. The bar is not really set very high. Well, Seems seems to indicate that he thinks it's pretty easy to get in the industry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> he, uh, he shares Mark and other sentiment that there's this belief that those running the rec businesses now are good people doing good work. And those running in the underground market or in the medicinal market in Washington's case, uh, prior to recreational legalization, were not good people and should not be running those businesses. Vincent, the store owner of a shop I call Elemental, is more closely aligned with Mark's attitudes that it's important for professionals to succeed in this industry so that the legalization movement can move forward. He explains his sentiments, his reasoning and his rationale as he was trying to figure out how to legalize, uh, whether or not he should try to get a business license. So he tells me, uh, I have an obligation. If this thing passes, I think I need to consider applying for a retail license because I think I'd be good at it. And I'd be horribly embarrassed if Washington State legalized and then the whole system failed because everybody who got involved was flaky and a stoner. Or there were all people that had nothing to lose. <laughs> With Vincent, he won. I spoke to him at this time after he was already running his business. He had won a recreational license with the lottery system like Mark, quit a day job, and invested all of his time into creating a professional and 
successful establishment. This idea is that these men's stores are becoming a model for what good, legitimate cannabis businesses should be and should look like was echoed among retail store staff as well. And Nick, a retail worker at Jane's Corner, summarizes the sentiment best. The recreational market needs legitimacy. And the image that a lot of companies have are becoming models for this, about what does a pot shop look like? What does cannabis look like when it's removed from the shady element it's always been associated with? This shady element represents the stereotypes and slang of the underground and the people in it. And those working in the industry are working to distance the new market from the legal, the illegal industry and the danger and trouble it brought. So the legalization movement can spread throughout the nation. But is this really a good way to look at it? Do we owe more than just destigmatizing cannabis to people and the communities that suffered the most from the war on drugs and from cannabis prohibition? While I was interviewing Mark, and, sell, and watching these stores sell large quantities of cannabis, Michael Thompson was still in prison. To go back to Mark and put his and Michael's experience into perspective, Michael Thompson was sentenced to 40 to 60 years in prison for selling what was likely between five to $10,000 of cannabis, while Mark's store, which I call Dr. Keith's Pot Shop, pulls in over $200,000 a month. While Michael Thompson sat in prison and his family learned to live without his presence, Mark, Steve, and Vincent, all wealthy white men from outside the industry, were establishing million-dollar businesses and getting in on the ground floor of one of the fastest-growing industries in the nation. Even more, when we just look at the numbers post-legalization, while well, overall arrests are down for cannabis-related crimes, the disparities in arrests are even greater than they were prior to legalization. Black individuals are now five times more likely to be arrested for a cannabis-related crime than white folks, which is double the rate it was before legalization. And in terms of business ownership, almost all cannabis businesses are owned by white individuals. Thus, the people who have suffered most from cannabis being illegal are not those who are reaping the most from this now legal industry. Now, there are cities and states with legal recreational industries, including Washington State, that are trying to go back and fix this. And this is where my future work is focused. How are other states and cities creating the rules and regulations for recreational cannabis, attempting to address these social justice motivations that allowed for legalization movement to take off? And also, how do the owners and retail staffs' reflections on their role in the industry and the legalization movement differ or maybe align with what I saw in Seattle before they started to address racial injustice? To provide some background, state, uh, states and cities trying to legalize cannabis now often start with thinking through how to incorporate equity and social justice into their plans. And they typically do this in three ways. The first is through criminal justice reform, as well as economic equity programs. And finally, through community impact plans. When we're talking about criminal justice reform, this is mostly thought about through expungement, or in other words, cleaning your record, cleaning your criminal record by erasing your past convictions, like sponging them out. The idea behind expungement of cannabis convictions is that if you are convicted of a crime that is no longer considered illegal, you should be able to get that arrest erased from your record. Criminal convictions, particularly drug convictions, create incredible hurdles to finding a job, securing housing, opening a bank account, getting into college, or getting a professional license, like a license to cut hair. Some of these barriers are formal barriers, like laws prohibiting someone with a conviction from obtaining a professional license, while others are due to discrimination of people with criminal records. By being able to erase one's record, the hope is that these barriers will be eliminated. However, in many cases, only a small number of cannabis convictions are allowed to be expunged, typically for offenses that 
would result from something that would be legal now for the average person, such as in Washington state, possession of cannabis, of one ounce of cannabis flower. <laughs> for people like Michael Thompson or others who were stopped for cannabis offenses, but charged with other convictions, would not qualify for this expungement program. And even with expungement, individuals living with criminal convictions for a long period of time likely have already suffered setbacks from their employment and their earnings that simply expunging a record wouldn't grant them, wouldn't give them that time back and wouldn't fix their employment history. Even more, expungement doesn't take into account all of the money paid into the criminal justice system through fines and fees. When you are arrested and convicted, you are given a set of fines and fees in addition to other punishments decided by the courts. Imagine a common traffic ticket. When you get a traffic ticket, it typically comes with a fine and then several fees added. The same thing happens in criminal convictions and individuals who do not pay their fines and fees until recently in Washington state were having 12% interest added on each month they didn't pay. With poor black individuals most likely to experience a cannabis related conviction, these communities have paid, have likely paid much more into the justice system for what is now legal than other groups and may still be paying off interest. Expungement doesn't give these communities their money back. And so there, while there are problems, another way they try to address, uh, states and cities try to address equity is to by providing economic opportunities directly to folks most harmed. You can think about equity in this picture. In the top image, you have equality. Everyone has access to the same bike or the same tools to achieve a similar goal, riding a bike. And while everyone has access to the same tools, not everyone can actually use those same tools equally. And that's where equity comes in. Equity means that everyone has different tools needed to achieve the same goal. So in this case, in the second case, everyone has a bike that's uniquely fitted to their needs so that they can achieve the goal of riding. In economic equity programs, typically offer incentives that can range from application fee waivers, technical assistance, like helping individuals develop a business plan uh, or sort through all the legal jargon and the legal um, difficulties of getting a license. Uh, they can have their applications for cannabis business license fast track. And even in one case, uh, they can even get discounted or temporary free business space. <laughs> and eligibility for these equity programs typically follows uh, three different buckets. The first uh, being disproportionately impacted areas. The second being if they themselves have a cannabis related conviction or uh, their family member has a cannabis related conviction or if they're low income or live in a low income area. <laughs> Disproportionately impacted areas though, are a pretty common way folks qualify for these equity programs in other states. And disproportionately impacted areas are areas that the city or the state has deemed to be disproportionately impacted by cannabis being illegal. They have high arrest rates for cannabis related convictions. Um, they're heavily policed for drug crimes. They're low income and sometimes they're uh, specifically my, in minority communities, particularly Black and Latinx communities. And while this helps to kind of address the areas that have been overly policed and providing economic opportunities directly to people most impacted, there are still a lot of problems with DIAs that cities and states have been encountering. For example, in some cases, the areas in which they're trying to pool people who live for economic opportunities um, are is too wide of an area, and it includes both intended targets of the program, as well as affluent communities that were not over policed. Also, uh, neighborhood change over time, and what was considered a poor neighborhood may not might actually be a wealthy one now. And so, paying attention to what urban scholars call gentrification can be kind of difficult. However, these are some of the issues I'm working on as a member. Uh, of the Washington State Task Force for Cannabis Equity, where we're trying to come up with a definition for DIAs in Washington State to implement a new equity program. And then finally, the next, the final uh, way that these uh, equity programs try to 
repair the harms done to communities of color are through community impact plans. In Massachusetts, for example, every single business license holder that is running a cannabis business has to come up with a measurable community impact plan or a plan that is designed to impact the communities most harmed by cannabis being illegal whether that's hiring folks from these disproportionate impacted areas or you know, hiring individuals with drug convictions or criminal uh, records and so forth. And another strategy for community impact is actually using some of the revenue generated from cannabis tax to put directly into communities of color through reparations funds. And while these all sound like good ideas, it's important to know that there are problems with both of these. Uh, for example, with the impact plan, sometimes it's hard for businesses to, it, it's unclear whether businesses really understand the difference between equality and equity. And with the reparations fund, uh, particularly in Evanston, Ohio case, it's unclear whether that money is actually gonna be able to get to the black community in Evanston, Illinois that had a reparations tax or whether or not it's only gonna go to a select number of people. And so through these three different pathways, individuals are really trying to repair these harms done. But I want to finish my talk today by returning to Michael Thompson. In 2018, 22 years into Michael Thompson's prison sentence, Michigan legalized recreational cannabis. And while Michigan celebrated a monumental victory for cannabis legalization, Michael remained behind bars for another two years. It took a national campaign and organizations working tirelessly until the governor granted him clemency. He was released in January of this year. Here he is with his granddaughters in a celebration, welcoming him home from prison and reacquainting him with his family. And he told reporters following his story, I just close my eyes and keep receiving that love because I haven't felt this kind of love in a long time. And I think Michael Thompson's story is emblematic of the problems facing those who are trying to legalize cannabis in a way in which, um, sorry, <laughs> that are trying to legalize cannabis in ways that seek to repair the harms done to communities of color during the war on drugs. How do you repair these harms? How do you start to build trust and try to heal these wounds? These are questions that remain to be answered. And right now, we have a lot of momentum and amazing thoughtful leaders doing this work. In my future research specifically, I'm continuing to talk to folks involved in the industry, these other cities and states that are attempting to grapple with these issues and help to try to answer these questions. And while I'm continuing to track criminal justice outcomes and leadership opportunities for people of color in these industries, I hope you will consider uh, the stories that I shared today and engage with Washington process by going and coming to the meetings for the Washington State Equity Task Force or looking at certain uh, advocacy groups like Can Inclusive um, and other and kind of understand what's going on in cannabis and try to advocate for more equitable industry. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Another excellent presentation. Uh, if you have questions for Michelle, make sure to put those in the chat below. Um, before you forget. All right, our final speaker is Ashley R. Towns. Ashley is a passion-driven fish ecologist, educator, and international in-field environmental researcher working in the realm of ecolog ecological restoration and natural resource management at various international agencies, NGOs, and institutions around the world. At the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, Towns, is studying both the behavior and ecology of spawning sockeye salmon and the effects of marine bi biogenetic habitat on groundfish species that are ecologically, commercially, and economically important. Ashley is a PhD student and environmental justice committee member for the city of Seattle's Office of Sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Ashley R. Towns. Thank you so much and good evening, everybody.
Awesome. Good evening, everybody. And again, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Megan. Um, so my presentation, quantifying habitat use of spawning sockeye salmon using individual movement data. Now, I know this may be a mouthful. Uh, this would typically be a title I would use for a presentation on my subject. But on this special occasion, I get to share what I love to do with people in this virtual space who are not all in my field of study. So I wanna scratch that, I don't wanna use that. It makes sense to change the title to something more appropriate that gets straight to the point of my talk, which is why research salmon and their upstream migration. Salmon are truly magnificent animals and considered sacred by many. And I would think that many people viewing this presentation would agree with me, especially to those living in the Pacific Northwest. As a Seattleite, I'd rather my Metro card be named the Salmon card instead of the Orca card, but maybe that's just me. As you can already tell, I love the salmon species, but let's talk about why they are so awesome. Pacific salmon are the keystone species, which means they are essential to the functioning of an ecosystem as a whole. And a keystone species is defined as an, any animal whose removal or reduction from an ecosystem harmfully affect the overall diversity, stability, and structure of an ecosystem. And in Alaska, where I work, uh, where I do most of my research, the biological foundation that to support the interdependent network of life is salmon. And many animals rely on them and oftentimes can't survive without them. So why should we care about salmon? Why do I study salmon? Why am I getting a PhD in salmon research? Well, the salmon industry provides a source of in in income for thousands of people. And the salmon industry is the most important industry in Alaska. And the average profit is around $230 million, but sometimes hitting almost 800 million. Secondly, recreational fishing provides pleasure, enjoyment, and satisfaction to those who participate in the sport of fishing. And salmon is one of the most nutritious foods on earth. It is the major source of protein. It is linked to improved well-being and a lower risk of many serious diseases. The salmon play a vital role in food security for millions of people around the planet. And salmon is also very, very culturally important to many coastal and native populations in First Nations. And this has been the case for over a thousand of years. So a salmon's journey, the journey home. Every year, millions of salmon carry out one of the most epic animal migrations on earth, traveling hundreds of miles from the ocean back to their birth streams, beaches, and rivers to breed. The journey back home is dangerous and challenging but a necessary journey each individual salmon must make in order to continue the family line. This is their ultimate and only goal in life. And once arriving at the place where they were born, breeding individual salmon line up at the entrance of the stream, much like runners at the start of a race before migrating upstream. And during their upstream migration, Female salmon will compete with other females for access to high quality breeding areas, while males will compete with other males to establish control and attempt to court the females in hopes of being selected, much like it's the final episode of the television series, The Bachelorette. Now salmon courtship and mating is incredibly interesting. And male salmon will swim up alongside a female salmon and quiver next to her when she's ready to release her eggs, which is called spawning. And when the female releases her eggs, the male fertilizes them with his sperm while both fish are side by side. Now salmon must always be on the lookout and always must be alert when they are spawning, releasing eggs, especially under predation. In many breeding streams I work in, in Alaska, there's always some bear somewhat close by lurking around and looking for smelling salmon. And salmon are a high calorie meal for bears. And bears know this. Specifically, bears prefer to eat the skin, the eggs, 
and the brain of salmon, which are the fattiest parts. Now, how does salmon select a place to breathe? So this is one of my study areas where I'm attempting to answer this question. And most of my research is in Bristol Bay, Alaska on two creeks called A Creek and C Creek. This is a picture of the shoreline of A Creek. And the University of Washington fishery researchers have been coming to these two creeks for over 20 years, monitoring the movement, the productivity and behavior of spawning sockeye salmon. So, to answer this question, how does salmon select a place to breed? I had to get up and closer with my research specimen, right? I put on my wetsuit, seriously I did. I wish it was uh, mechanical as such as what you see in this photograph. And I shot some underwater videos and I monitored their movement, which gave me a lot of insight about how they behave individually and collectively. I also looked high and low on the landscape and examined the different features of the stream, the different breeding areas I was investigating. So on the right, I am examining the water depth of the area with the meter stick. And on the right, I'm using a range finder to get the slope and other distant measurements of the stream. And you know, I had to get really bitty, really buddy buddy with my specimen, so I took a photo of it. Now the way to think about how a salmon chooses a place to breed is thinking about how a person looks to buy, looking to buy a house. There are several things to consider when buying a house, right? Perhaps it's the number of rooms, the closet and storage space, about the community and surrounding area. What about all of it, all of the above? So what a salmon does when it reaches its home stream, the place where it was born, it waits for a signal that will tell it when to move upstream. That signal could be a social signal or an env environmental signal. And along the way, it surveys different areas of the creek before selecting a breeding area. This is a computer generated map of a stream that, re that represents my study area. And my study area is divided into several different sections. These sections are roughly 10 meters each or where a major change in the landscape attributes occurs. You can see there are different numbers of fish in the different sections. Now each day during the breeding, se during the breeding season, fish ecologists like myself will walk up the entire stream and along the way we count the number of fish we see and record the, the location where it was seen. And we also take biological samples and collect DNA from each individual fish. Now, each stream section has its own, own unique qualities and landscape attributes. Some stream sections are in good condition, but other streams are so-so or not so good. So what is considered a good breeding area for fish? Streams that have undercut banks, steady water flow, and vegetation cover are good for salmon. And in this photo, there's much of undercut bank where the tree that is coming out from the side of the stream bank, um, undercut banks provide refuge for sockeye salmon and the possibility for individuals to avoid predators, bears. Uh, the vegetation cover that you see, the green ferns and the other grasses provide protection from shade uh, and territorial isolation. And the water flow in this section seems to be flowing at a steady rate in the area as well. You can see the riffles in the lower right-hand side of the photograph. The water flow plays an important part in the egg development of breeding salmon. So overall, this section of the stream could be potentially considered a good breeding area. The three highlighted attributes in the breeding area is undercut bank, water flow, and cover, and this section received high scores. So on to the bad. In contrast, this photo shows stream water depth, which looks shallow. There's a lot of exposed rock and it's pretty wide. And it's very, very much exposed to potential predators. And the water flow seems a bit still and not flowing too much. This does not appear to be too much underbake as well. So you can see the breeding area quality of the three attributes in this stream section received very low scores. Now breeding areas are not always just good or bad. 
There could be some aspects of the breeding area that is okay, and it may not be the best, but it's not the worst either. The breeding area could have a lot of undercut bank, giving it a, maybe a score of five. The gravel in the area could be just okay. And there may not be a lot of buck cover in the area, giving a score of one in this example. So let's think of the breeding area of salmon as a checkered board. The squares represent the quality of breeding area, potential home of the salmon. The green squares mean good breeding quality, breeding area quality, while the yellow squares is okay, breeding area quality, and the red means that breeding quality area is bad. Let's say a salmon enters a stream and it's the first to arrive there. Where do you think it will go? Do you expect it to move to the best breeding area, the green? I would think so. Uh oh, there's another fish entering the stream. Where do you think it's, where do you think it would go? As more and more fish enter the stream, there will be an increase of competition of accessing the best breeding area, the green squares. And there will be a decrease in the amount of space it can provide a fish. In this scenario, where do you think the individual with the black circle around it would go? Now it could take its chances and try and access the best breeding areas, which are the green squares, right? But there's a lot of salmon who may not let the salmon fish, may not, may not let this individual fish into the area. It might show some aggressive behavior. They might be bigger. Now there's a few okay spots, the yellow squares, but the chances of breeding success is a bit lower. Um, it's, so, it's just bad, it's just okay, right? So. The reason it may be okay, again, because bears are in the area or the habitat quality is low, the area. It could also try its luck in the bad breeding areas because there's not that many fish in those squares, but its chances have definitely decreased in regards to breeding successfully. So in my research, I use location data and stream data, which I've talked about. Um, and I also use genetics and statistical models. My location data specifies where in the stream each individual fish was seen each day before it died. And my stream data consists of the measurements of different aspects of the stream landscape, such as water depth, other cut bank, and water flow. And this, I also use genetics that I tend to use at a later date to find out how many offspring, how many babies an individual had in a particular breeding location. And lastly, using the both location data and stream data I use mathematical statistics to answer my research question and forecast the likelihood of an individual selecting a breeding area. So what am I finding? What is the data showing me? What we've discovered is that individual salmon have a favorite breeding area. There are breeding areas, so one of my two creeks that I work on, A and C creeks, that continue to be selected time and time again by salmon because of the attributes we talked about, especially the undercut banks. Undercut banks are turning out to be an attribute that is influencing the movement and special distribution. And in this graph, it depicts what we are seeing at the two Alaskan creeks that I work on. And in this graph, home C on average had the highest number of fish across 15 years. It was the most popular stream section. When you examine on a fine scale what attributes the home C had that were so attracted by salmon, um, what you find is that the largest undercut bank, the water depth was at an ideal depth for salmon, and the elevation of home sea was above average, among other attributes that influenced the individual salmon to select it. So formulating a few mathematical equations and putting it into a statistical model with the real data, and, and what we're finding is that there's a lot of fish that return to these rivers and creeks the probability of selecting the best breeding area will decrease. So in regards to home sea, which was the most popular breeding area by salmon, individuals will most likely select home sea when there are not a lot of fish around, but as more and more fish flood the stream, the probability of choosing home sea will go down. Fish would then likely choose the second best home. And in this case, the second best breeding area, best home is home A followed by home B, and then home D as the last best site. Now the reason why the likelihood of an individual selecting the best site goes down is because the quality of that habitat goes down as more individuals occupy that space. 
what the breeding area can provide an individual fish in terms of a high chance of successfully having offspring, it goes down as the number of individuals in that space increase. Think of it as if there's not enough space for everyone or um, it isn't enough of the resource to share with everyone. Individuals would maybe do better in selecting an okay space. Remember the yellow squares um, because it isn't as crowded or the competition isn't as fierce. So the summary of my preliminary results tells me that breeding area quality, the population size are controlling the distribution of salmon and influencing the selection and use of certain stream areas. And it's also shedding light that there are breeding area qualities that are preferred over another, which could help ecologists and fishery managers predict the occupancy of breeding fish um, and forecast their future movements. And the last part of this research project is to analyze the genetic sequences and figure out if these high quality breeding areas do produce more fish. We know that some salmon stay in one breeding area while others mobilize between good and bad, which is a behavioral strategy that they employ to avoid predators. And knowing which behavioral strategy and breeding areas produce more fish and will inform management and develop a more appropriate and effective restoration plans. So some things I want you all in Zoom land in this virtual space to think about is that climate change is real and rising temperatures in Alaska and around the world are altering the aquatic landscapes, including streams and beaches and rivers that individual fish are, are occupying. And salmon are also already changing their breeding area preferences and their trajectories and routes of getting back home. And this is a heat map showing the change of heat intensity over the course of four days back in 2019 in Alaska. And Alaska is one of the fastest warming states in the nation. Secondly, there's some other modern threats out there. consist of development of transportation roads and mining, which could negatively impact salmon populations and the livelihoods of who depend on this resource. This is a map of the proposed plan of a pebble mine in Alaska. The pebble mine is a giant copper and gold mine which for to be at the headwaters of the world's greatest wild salmon fishery in Bristol Bay, my study area. This research that I am involved in is an effort to better understand the breeding behavior of sockeye salmon to inform our actions to prevent or mitigate these negative consequences from environmental and human disturbances to the unique watersheds. And lastly, a team of researchers have been looking into the best sources of protein for future long space missions to Mars. So far, it looks like fish might be the answer. A 2020 study in which a team of multidisciplinary scientists tested the impact of vibrations on fish, mimicking the effect of space flight launch. What they found is that fish eggs were able to withstand the extreme conditions and still hatch. Indeed, I might try and team up with Hector, who presented on exoplanets, and try and really get fish on Mars. So, in conclusion, I'm going to ask the question again Why should we care about salmon? I'm sure you all can answer it now. Because salmon are economically, culturally, nutritiously, and recreationally important. It significantly impact a variety of ecosystems and people. So we must make an intentional effort to protect them and sustain their populations. Therefore, salmon matter. And I hope now you all would agree. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. I really appreciate that presentation. Um, okay, we're gonna transition into questions. Um, we're gonna start with some questions. If you have any questions for Ashley, please make sure those get in the chat, but we're gonna start with some questions for Hector. Um, so our first question for you, Hector, 
what do you hope to gain from finding extraterrestrial life? What good would this information be to the science community? Um, so for the science community, it would be, uh, it's just that I think that answering the question of like, are we alone in the universe is a question that will revolutionize us, not only scientifically, but also philosophically and maybe spiritually and also personally. So uh, just by saying scientifically, I feel it's just, uh, uh, you know, it would, it would revolutionize it more, but, but scientifically speaking, I would say that it would think it would, it would help us at least think of, um, what ways life could be, because maybe we find life and it's not life as we know it. We, it could be some sort of light that is not, you know, uh, based on nitrogen or needs oxygen or needs water. We don't know what could life be. And this would just revolutionize our thinking of how do we approach biology and, but also how do we approach ourselves life and how do we see ourselves in, in the universe? And I think it would also make this more insignificant. <laughs> so, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I think that's a, a wonderful answer. I really appreciate that. Um, our next one for you, Hector. I would love to hear more about your projections, theories, and other experiences in the space world. Do you think we should try to give to get humans living on other planets? I so uh, it's a that's a complex question because I think that you know like I I grew up liking liking shows like Lloyd in Space. I don't know if no one if anyone remembers that or Star Wars and you know and also teenage shows like Futurama. So I've always liked that idea of traveling outside of Earth. Uh, but we, I think we do have to keep in mind, how do we do it? Do we want to go the route of colonization, which is something that I'm not up against, I'm not up for. So it is something that we do have to keep in mind now that we're like, our technology is advancing and we might be able to, in the near future, go to Mars, for example. Do we, if there's life on Mars, how do we want to treat it? And that's something that while I, I do enjoy fantasizing about traveling to other planets, I, it also worries me on how are we going to do it. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Our next question for you. Does the James Webb Space Telescope have the ability to detect biomolecules such as amoebo acids or DNA in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere of exoplanets? Okay. Uh, from what I remember, I think it, I haven't tried it. That's what I think of. I'm not sure if it can or not. It's just that I've, I've gone for mostly molecules that could be present in the atmosphere. Usually, for example, like amino acids, which it, even though they're microscopic, they tend to be pretty big in, for, for, for a molecule. And if they're big, they might not be floating in the atmosphere. So if they're not in the atmosphere, meaning that they're in the surface, then James Webb wouldn't be able to see it. But if let's say there's an important molecule for, for us humans that, you know, like uh, that is uh, light, maybe, maybe James Webb could see it, but that's something that I haven't worked on. So that's a good idea to look at. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for the idea. So. <laughs> All right, last question for you. Where will the telescopes you mentioned in the last part of your presentation be located once they are launched? Uh, so at least the Habitable Exoplanet Telescope, the, um, the Origin Space Telescope, and the Louvoir Telescope, they are going to be space telescopes. They are, right now, they're called what, uh, they're known as mission concepts, meaning that they're not officially approved, and possibly one of them might just be approved, not all of them. So in any case of those three, one of the, uh, the it's gonna be in space. It's gonna be located in space like the James Webb Telescope, which, fingers crossed, is gonna be launched in October, 2021. Although it was supposed to launch in 2016. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not well, we'll see, we'll see. But those three will be in space. And then the Lynx, the Lynx X-ray Observatory, I'm honestly not sure where would it be. That's, that's the only one I, I wasn't that sure about. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was incredibly informative and yeah, really fun. I appreciate your, um, your perspective on space and yeah, very interesting. All right, thank Michelle, you. you're up next. Um, all right. So our first question for you, 
is there a resource of existing black owned cannabis retailers in Washington and your thoughts on how cannabis consumers can best support the creation of more? Yes, I, I always get this question and um, I wish there was a list. Uh, Canaclusive, that's C-A-N-N-A-C-U-L-C-I-V-E. Um, they do have like a working Google doc that has a list of black owned cannabis shops throughout the country. Um, I'm not sure how often they update that. Um, and I'm not sure if that they have Washington on there, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's only 3% of retailers, 3% of about 500 licenses are owned by black individuals. Um, and there's none, well, besides the one that Sean Kemp partially owns in Seattle, there's none outside of that in Seattle. Um, but there are, we are looking at trying to create um, not just allocating the licenses that have become inactive. So people that their businesses had to close or, um, you know, they violate too many laws or they just never were able to get that license off the ground. There's 37 licenses we're looking to allocate to um, new equity applicants. So, you know, look for people in the future. Uh, more businesses of color will be um emerging in Seattle, there'll be potentially more licenses available that outside of that 37 or different types of licenses. Um, and so once though, you know, there will be a lot of information about how to support businesses once they start opening. But other than that, you know, look for brands that are um, black owned too. There's a, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the name, but there are some brands that are black owned. So you can, you can find that, um, online. It should be in the Canaclusive list and, and other sources. I wish there was a central source for that information, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good start. And that's something to think about too. I brands versus um, stores. Um, all right. Our next question for you. Are there any differences in the arrests between states that have some form of legalization and states that have no legalization standards? Yeah, that's actually a really difficult question to ask um, or to answer, to ask. <laughs> easy to ask. Easy to ask. To <laughs> um, so one of the problems with measuring cannabis arrests is that not every state uh, tracks it the same. Um, and a lot of times cannabis offenses are wrapped up into drug offenses. And so um, I think that there's definitely, there's definitely a difference between the number of arrests for cannabis crimes uh, just because of legalization just completely um, kind of dips off. Uh, but in terms of the differences between disparities, that's something definitely we need to look at, something I hope to look at in the future is, you know, what's happening in these neighboring states too, you know, are they that don't have legalization um, versus states that do? Are there more arrests happening on those state borders? Or, yeah, it's definitely something to look into. Fantastic. All right. This is our last question for you, and it's kind of a multi-parter. So how did you learn about Michael Thompson's case, and are you personally in touch with him or his family? What sticks out to, to you about his case, since there are likely many more like his? Yeah, so the Michael Thompson case has been covered um, by national news, and it, it sticks out to me. It's one of the, um, you know, he's serving one of the longest sentences that resulted from a cannabis uh, crime in the U.S. today. And so, um, so that's what really sticks out to him. But there are definitely examples of folks um, who have been stopped and have been cited. I think, um, you know, recently Dante Wright was, you know, stopped. He had a cannabis uh, a conviction and owed fines and fees on that. And so, you know, it's still, there are so many examples of not just um, cannabis incidences, but how those can escalate into more violent encounters. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Michelle, for um, that presentation, taking these questions and bringing this topic to our audience. I really appreciate it. Okay, Ashley, you're up next. Um, so, your first question we have from the audience, how does the ecosystem for salmon in Alaska compare to the state of the ecosystem in Seattle? Ooh, that's a very, very um, awesome question. I would say that, you know, 
Alaska's ecosystem is incredibly heterogeneous, meaning it's so diverse and there's its, its landscape and it's incredibly pristine in regards to the, the water quality, um, the vastness and the glacial um, water that um, enters the various streams and tributaries of the area. So it's definitely about the geography and the um, water, I would say, that makes it so, so unique um, where these salmon have been coming for, for thousands of years um, and it just hasn't been touched. You know, Seattle is one of what, the fastest growing nations in the nation and it's, it's being touched everywhere. And um, the, the, the configuration of the landscape is changing dramatically, uh, which is not happening as much in, in Alaska because of the protections and because of the advocacy of, of tribal communities saying, hey, please do not drill here, please do not touch this. We've, we've had this um, excellent flow of resources such as fish come in um, that have never been um, impacted. So that's why, so, so think of it like, you know, I don't know, like Lord of the Rings in a sense, it's so magical, <laughs> Alaska, you know? Um, there's different photos everywhere um, that are just like, you know, the, the watershed keepers. Um, so that's how I would say it, you know, urban and also um, incredibly rural where I work. Great, thank you. All right, our next question. What are the social and environmental signal, signals that, you, that tell the salmon that it's time to start their migration up the river? How do they know? Oh, I love this. I love this question. Um, well, the social is a very new kind of, a new research is being do done in regards to salmon talking to each other. Um, and how they are responding to the movement when they are together at the mouth, meaning the, the interest of the stream. I, I had a photograph that I took out for this, this presentation, but it's um, also a video, just them kind of just moving together in, in this fluid motion. So it's kind of maybe you can say, and this is new research, like they're copycatting, they see someone go or they feel someone go. Uh, so that's this kind of social cues that's been, um, uh, research has been uh, developing in that, in that realm. Um, so there's new information to be shed on that. And the environmental cues, I would say number one is the, the flow of water. So um, when there's heavy rainfall, that's, that elevates the, the water levels. Um, so most likely will, they will be successful in reaching those best habitats or getting really, really far upstream uh, where they were born. Um, so that's an incredible um, uh, environmental signal. So water flow and um, yeah, and coolness, temperature is a, is a variable, right? Uh, especially when I was talking about climate change, um, that can give a false signal, right? Um, it's not time to really go, but you think it's time to go because of the, the change in temperature at a certain time. Um, so those are kind of two major um, environmental signals that uh, tell the same when you go up. Okay, great. So related to that question, okay. how do the salmon decide when to stop their migration? Do they pick the best home as soon as they find it, or do they keep going in the hopes to find a better spot? Y'all are banging out some awesome questions, y'all. Um, this is another facet of my research, aspect of my research. Um, there's a lot of mobility among uh, male salmon. So it's just like, are they, you know, surveying the, the area? Are they scoping? Are they just really trying to get to the 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 actual actual place they were they were born or in the close proximity, um, we don't really know the answer. Um, you know, it, it depends on all these factors such as uh, predators that are around. Again, who was in the space? Um, but usually they have these reserves. You know, I studied the final phase of the of, of sockeye salmon. Um, this is the final stage of their life. They're going to die. So there's also a clock there, right? How much energy they have left to get get to a good place, find a girlfriend, <laughs> right? And um, like stop their migration and, and just settle and, 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 and reproduce. But um, we're getting, trying to getting close to when they actually stop, but I can't really say for sure, but um, it's an individual uh, thing. Fantastic. All right, so I got the last question for you. Is the salmon an endangered animal due to overfishing? Uh, I believe certain species are. I think there's a, uh, you know, catch limits on Atlantic salmon. Um, I know there are certain uh, species in um, California where they are endangered. endangered. Um, so there's, a, that's, I guess, where you see like aquaculture coming in, right? Where farm salmon. 
um, because of those disparities or because of the dwindling populations in certain regions of the United States and world, um, but not in uh, Alaska, but there are some and uh, depends on the actual the lineage or population in that area. So um, we're always trying to advocate and, and protect them, but yeah. Thank you. All right. Absolutely fantastic. Always fun to learn more about salmon, an evergreen topic, in my opinion. Um, so I want to thank you, Ashley, Hector, Michelle, uh, for joining us at tonight. And uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in. We love to see the community support for these students and their work. Our next UW Engage Science event is next Monday, May 10th. So please join us then. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. <laughs>